this is Candace Salima, and we are speaking with Dr. Nancy Cobrin, who is the author of The Banality of Suicide Terrorism. Now, uh, Nancy, we were talking uh, about quite a bit, but mostly about the, um, the developmental part of a child's life from in utero to about three years of age. And so you were going to make a couple of points just before we went to the breaks. So if you wouldn't mind doing that now, we will pick up where we left off. Okay, well, I, one, I, w- I always like to um, make a distinction between fear and terror. And um, I relo- relate, I locate terror in the first years of life before this time where a child doesn't really have the verbal capacity to talk about what is bothering them. And this is, it's very, very important because when we say, why don't Westerners get it? Um, I have been humbled by doing all of this work, and the more and more I do it, and obviously you can imagine that um, counterterrorism is basically male-dominated and hence pretty macho, and (laughs) you can imagine the amount of resistance when I first started presenting um, my thoughts about it. Uh, I can well imagine. <laughs> the, their eyes would sort of glaze over when I would mention the mother. But, um, however, uh, there is this uh, uh, deepening awareness, I think, uh, that they have to begin to look earlier. Now, um, the mother does play a big role, and actually I came across something fascinating that in the Kamikaze's pilot's manual, the Kamikaze's were instructed not to fear death because when they were within a couple meters of their target, their face of their mother would appear. So they would rejoin their mother in death. And this is this whole problem of traumatic (laughs) bonding that they can't ever really separate from their mother. And the mother is always, I mean, for all of us, none of us ever totally separate from our mother, but we don't go around killing each other people, nor are we brainwashed into killing each other, killing people. Well, consider the mastery of what the kamikaze pilots were told. All kamikaze pilots died. That was their job. Suicide mission, suicide bomber. They used the plane as the bomb. There was no way for anyone to disprove what these kamikaze pilots were told because the only way they would see their mother is if they were actually just before death. So that's quite masterful, I have to admit, yeah. if not twisted. <laughs> yes, and it's very interesting. Uh, it's very tragic and interesting, but also it's a shame on our culture. Yeah. And you have, you know, samurai warrior, and um, uh, Japan has always struggled in. Um, uh, it's been very difficult for them to make reparation to get to the level of uh, guilt, so to speak, after World War II. Um, and you can think of uh, the Korean comfort women in, in this regard, et cetera. But also Al-Qaeda resorted to using planes like kamikazes. And there was even a Al-Qaeda training camp that was called Islamakazi. Really? And, yes. And so, uh, so this whole um, milieu uh, – points, though, back to something that's going on very, very early developmentally. And, and it's te- I feel it's terrifying to people because if you think about in the West, we still have a lot of trouble, um, and, and I feel personally we're too shocked that there are episodes of domestic violence. And... So I say that this political domestic violence of the suicide attack uh, taps into our earliest terrors that all of us have about um, feeling nurtured and taken care of and bonded with our mothers and our vulnerabilities. 
And if we find domestic violence uh, so difficult to talk about, we've come a long way, of course. Um, you can imagine how the suicide attack taps into kind of the same very uh, deep level of, um, of terror that we all have. I call it a communicative circuit, you know, and we get, it just boots it automatically and it's very, very difficult. That's one of the reasons why I think it's hard for Westerners to understand it. The well, other, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. The other goes back to like the serial killer. In all the reports, you always hear, oh, the suicide bomber, he was such a nice guy. Uh, he lived next door, blah, blah, That's blah. Not just familiar. Like, <laughs> yeah. And again, it's that um, it's hard for people to look beyond the surface because it, it, it's sort of like this terror is so so um, gripping that we dissociate from it and we prefer to be in denial. And um, the uh, terrorist, we call them terrorists, and they project out their terrors into us, and we might not even be aware of it. And okay, now explain again what the terrors, the uh, uh, this is going to be an awkwardly phrased question. I apologize. The terrors that terrorists have that they're projecting on us. What are those terrors? Some of them would be about um, being completely uh, vulnerability, uh, the, even death. Uh, it's almost like a uh, counterphobia that they are obsessed with death. That they love death. We love life. It's like they're trying to work through the idea that there's actually death and they can't quite get their minds around it, because this is a very grandiose, um, omnipotent kind of environment. Whenever you have a fused, a highly fused group and the individual is secondary to the group, there's no boundary, boundaries, it's very grandiose. And that grandiosity um, is like a a defense or a shield against feeling extremely vulnerable, feeling impotent. I mean, uh, you know, the father in a, um, in, let's say, for example, Saudi Arabia, where you can have many wives, father is absent, and the, and the female is cloaked in black because the fear of what the female will arouse in the male and that the male will not be able to control himself. And so this is... So in other words, this is, yeah, this is something Thank that's you. been in my mind, uh, Nancy, since I read your book. Life is about learning to control your passions, learning to control yourself so that you can be the most successful um, person that you can be and contribute well to society. It seems as if in the Arabic culture... It is the exact opposite. Uh, it's very, very difficult when you have um, this kind of dynamic of devaluing the other. And the other, I would stress here, you could be male, but you'll be treated like a female. And I will, uh, I want to get to that uh about um, like Al Qaeda and looking at Judaism and Christianity because they're really viewed as the devalued female, just like they devalue females in their own setting. They look at the other as female. But um, what you're, what I think you're pointing to is the lack of psychological infrastructure because yes. the, because of of what is not getting developed early in childhood that leaves the individual at a loss of having good social skills, being able to uh, interact and um, move forward. And, and you look at, I mean, you can look at um, 
uh, uh, throughout uh, the Arab Spring, for example, and you know everybody <laughs> wants social justice, but it's beginning to fall apart again because there are no there's a lack of if you don't have good psychological infrastructure, you're going to have a hard problem developing a citizenry that will ha- be able to do good uh, civic infrastructure that works. Okay, That's so let me, let me ask this. So it's sort of a – actually, Halim Barakat, who's a Egyptian sociologist, once wrote – that the family, the Arab Muslim family, is a microcosm for the society. And I think he put it really well. If the family is that bound up in these kinds of problems, it's not rocket science that you're going to have them uh, in your civic society as well. It makes sense. That's well, where you seems learn. To me, yeah, it seems to me that the – the Arabic child is not taught the value of independent thought. They are taught group mentality, mob mentality from birth. It yes, seems, it's, it's, I, I, that's what I'm understanding that you're saying, if I'm understanding yes, it's it properly. About domina- it's about domination and control because the adult is also terrified. And, he, and when you are... Do they run out and kill everybody else? <laughs> So th- this is uh, part of the problem. It's like two steps forward and three steps back or one step back. But you see this also in how difficult it's been for the troops in Iraq and Afghanistan to uh, be able to build, uh, to help build and to sort of disconnect it's interesting because the connection to the Taliban was so, has been so tight and to redo that tie, but it's this problem of maternal bonding that then resurfaces as social bonding. So okay, and this is, you, you, you got problem. right to the point that I wanted to get to. The foreword of your book is written by Phyllis Chesler, and she puts forth some very interesting information and thought as to the relationship between mother and son and mother and daughter in the Arabic family. And it, it uh, gives a foundation for your work. And, and she, I don't know if it was you or her that went all the way back to Muhammad and drew those parallels. Was that you, Nancy, or was that Phyllis? Um, I think both of us did it. Uh, well, let's do book. that. Yes. Let's draw those parallels so that they can understand that it has been a generational problem for millennia that that has brought us to this point, and and so that the listeners also have that strong foundation that you and I have. Um, I uh, let me first uh, preface that by saying that I think it's important to look at the relationship. Uh, of how Westerners look at Judaism, Christi- Christianity, and Islam. Okay, let's do that. And uh, because uh, when you say, well, West- why don't Westerners get it? It's very interesting that generally um, we talk about them as the three Abrahamic faiths. Yes. And uh, as being cousins or siblings, I, I have some problems with that, the metaphor of the family, but more important than that is the relationship of the revelations. And so uh, you have Judaism. I kind of look at it uh, when I do my PowerPoint as a stack of pancakes. We could analyze why I chose that, but um, I put <laughs> Judaism on the bottom and then Christianity, and then Islam, because we know That'd that be the proper order that Judaism for um, Jewish people revelation ended at Sinai at the giving of the law at Sinai and Moses receiving the law, and then the um, with the New Testament uh, and the Gospels uh, that the revelation is reopened, and then. Uh, Muhammad, who you were talking about, 
uh, comes along and receives from allegedly from Gabriel the um, revelation, and he's called the prophet of the seal, and that this closes revelation, well, of course, for Islam, but the belief in Islam is that um, uh, that it pre-existed Judaism and that Judaism and Christianity uh, corrupted the revelations. So, yeah, history the, doesn't bear that out. I mean, if you just go with time, you know, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's sort, of like, it's sort of like doing an end run around uh, and rewriting the, narrat- the, the narrative. So well, actually, the, they rewrote history, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and so that this so that this makes it very complicated because um it's the uh because uh, one thing um a lot of people are not aware of uh that Judaism Islam is very similar to Judaism up to a point the prophet borrowed extensively from Judaism and from the Jewish tribes in Saudi Arabia with the hopes of converting them. But then that didn't happen. And that's the point at which um, the Prophet Muhammad started launching his doctrine of jihad and Islam became very expansionistic. And to well, go and back- I think it's important for people to know that Muhammad when he wasn't accepted by a pro- as a prophet or as the Messiah, he took all the men and boys from that Jewish tribe whose name I cannot remember, I apologize, um, and killed them all and took the women captive. Yes. And, uh, He's like a two-year-old in the most extreme, dangerous temper tantrum. Uh, this was the tribal culture of the time. And uh, this is the same, it's very concrete behavior. And when you think of, I, I immediately associate to Zarqawi, you probably remember him right. in Iraq, did all the beheadings. Yeah. You know, it's sort of what, what that says unconsciously is that if you don't agree with somebody, you don't agree with their thoughts, you just cut off their head. So, like, we could have Alice in Wonderland with the queen saying off with your head, but it's, it's a fantasy that we are all aware of. Whereas in this particular um, extreme uh, behavior, it's concretized. And so this is the same, this is in this, this is all part of um, terrorist behavior that it's very, it's so concrete and so in our face that it's very hard to see what it really is. I don't know if that makes sense, but it does. It does make sense. I, I think a good it's way. Horrifying, horrifying. It is. It is completely horrifying. And Al Zarqawi was was a horrible, horrible man, in my opinion. I, I don't care what his traumas were as a child. <laughs> You don't go around chopping people's heads off. Anyway, um, let's let's use Muhammad Atta as an example of of uh, what you're talking about. This twisted relationship they have with their mothers, and and an elemental piece of the development, as you said earlier, is missing, and um, what it delivers. I was quite disturbed by what you you wrote about Atta, who was one of the 9/11 bombers. I believe he flew into the one of the twin towers, if I remember right. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes, he was. Uh, uh, you know, he was uh, uh, again well trained. Uh, he was uh, training to be uh, an engineer, if my memory serves me correctly, and part of the Hamburg group. And uh, he did. Uh, it's uh, sort of underestimated when they say that he did uh, witness his mother being abused by his father. Um, and he also was known to have 
sat in his mother's lap until he left home. Um, as an adult. As an adult. And uh, this is, um, uh, you know, he, what this speaks to an incapacity to separate and to feel uh, sort of like you can compete in the world. And uh, he harbored extreme rage and was able to act it out under the political guise of hating others and um, uh, and being just enthralled with um, Al Qaeda. Okay, let me so ask this: it, it has Do a, these men? have any kind of love for their mothers, or is it such a damaged relationship due to the self-identity of the woman that that uh, it, it twists them mentally? And then why is not that, that hatred, that hate, geared towards the father? Uh, there is, uh, it's an interesting question. There, the father is... Um, a terrifying figure, but the father is also absent. Uh, and the father is not setting boundaries for the son because the son is sort of abandoned to his mother as the father goes off to his other wives. So uh, the, the, the father, very often in studies on Arab Muslim culture, They'll talk about the father, the author, authoritarian father. You know, it's sort of like he, the little boy grows up to be a dysfunctional adult. Uh, and, um, but the father is a symptom, again, of the underlying problem of the devalued female. So... Uh, okay, let's look at a summer then. Pardon? Go ahead. Osama bin Laden. You used him as an example, and and uh, this the, he's the a perfect example of what you're talking about with the authoritarian father who is absent, the mother who was the fourth wife, which I did not know. This is one of the things I learned in your book is is a um, a, a open door, swinging door type of position in the, the fourth, Islamic the, marriage. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The fourth wife is the one that can be easily divorced and then another wife can be taken. So it's ongoing. It's a revolving door. Okay, so use Osama bin Laden's um, history that brought him to the point he is now to explain what you are talking about. Because his, his mother was the fourth wife. She was known as the slave wife. He was known as the son of the slave, so on, so on, you know. Right. Right. And, you know, he was one of, I mean, whether there, there 54 siblings, something like that. And, you know, none of the girls' names are ever recorded because the female is that devalued. And, um, and also birthdays are not um, considered to be important because why that would instill a sense of individuality. So everything works against being... Uh, a fully functioning individual, and um, he, uh, his mother was. He was also separated from his mother early on. She was sort of uh, exiled uh, to another part in Saudi Arabia, and so this is another trauma for a little kid. Um, but he became he became swept up in radical. Um, Islam, very extremist, very early on, and uh, and then built this entire uh, kind of uh, empire to destroy the West. And um, I think that uh, it's... Uh, it was very telling that they were finally able to find him, hunt him down, and, you know, kill him. And he was uh, buried at sea, which was um, apropos. 
Um, why, why was it apropos, Nancy? Because otherwise they would make a shrine out of his place of burial. And uh, so they, you know, I don't think the military could risk burying him. I mean, this was, this was the appropriate thing to do. But I mean, it's so, um, I'm sort of at a loss to specifically, uh, you know, he had such charisma. This is the other thing that it just drew, um, it drew the members to him, and uh, others oath, equally damaged. That yes, that uh, the oath uh, to him and. Um, but clearly, I mean, there are, uh, his sister-in-law wrote a biography, a, a memoir, and, um, he would do extreme things to his own children. He would deny them, um, uh, cold water and, uh, even, um, milk at one point and all, all sorts. He was, uh, really um a very when you look back on his uh what we know about him uh it's quite disturbing and, it is. and uh, you know you, you talked about how he was very charismatic well so was Ted Bundy yes they're they're they all have a kind of charisma they have uh and it's very it's almost it's i i feel it's predatory and yes. that this is where you have to look at the body language. And the, one, of, one of the reasons why I think it's hard for Westerners is that we get very locked into the verbal language and the written text. And so we'll look at the ideologies of Islam. Yes, they're important, but they act as a girdle for a very fragile personality. And the, it's the body language that's really um, key to cracking the nut and exposing them for what they are. And when we talk about charisma, um, you know, it also links back to our identification with the aggressor. And Bin Laden put, put it well that people like a strong horse, and it can be at the expense of the those who are really in the right and they become victim they're targeted as um a, as the prey and um uh it's not in arab muslim culture you have to be the bully is venerated so that tells you a lot about the dynamics of the group and what it must like what it must be like to grow up in that kind of environment. It's very Okay, here's the scary. next Yes, it's very scary. And here's my next question. What is the difference between the Arab Muslim culture and other Muslim cultures? Is this pervasive in every Muslim family or is it unique to the Arabic culture? Um I there are so many commonalities and I have studied quite a bit about Afghanistan, and I was hoping to deploy there, and I went through the Human Terrain Program in Leavenworth, Kansas, and studied Dari and Pashto. Um, I, I would say that the thing is the Arab culture is the sort of like the golden boy for Muslim culture because the locus of Islam is in Saudi Arabia and you have Mecca and Medina and they are the 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 authoritative um Islam so to speak it's venerated so, so they're inseparable it's, it's like it's sort of yes and I did a uh, because I um spent many years in say in St. Paul Minnesota uh since 1978 until 2008 and I trained in 320 sheriff deputies on radical Islam in Hennepin County. Um, I 
became extremely interested in Somali culture. And I even, I love languages. So I also started trying to teach myself um, Somali. And again, the Somalis that I talked to, um, they had the belief that they were descended from the Arabs. Why? Because they venerate the Arabs and they're not Arab. So it's, it's, um, it's not so easy to separate out and say what is Arab and non-Arab in a way because Arab culture holds a tremendous influence and it's still very tribal. And even here in Israel with the Palestinian um, population, you have the Hamula, which is the clan. And in Somali culture, you have uh, clan affiliation also. It, so again, the family is the, it's such a tight group that the individual is not valued. Um, and, and that makes it very, very difficult uh, to break away from the group. And you probably know Ayan Hirsi Ali's writings on Somali culture. She's the gal that wrote Sub, the movie Submission with Theo Van Gogh and yeah. Van Gogh was murdered in Holland. Yeah. And uh, she talks about this extensively, you know, that to break away, it's like you have to give up everything to break free from the the cult. It's a, a very much cult behavior oriented. So um, that is a perfect parallel. Nancy, that okay. that should that be the key that has understand. locked it in the Western mind. Yes, because there is no self-identity. It's all group identity. It's all group thought. And that's a cult. Yes. Yes. And um, that did it. So it has. Uh, um, so and because of this kind of um, configuration, obviously with the baby, very early on, there is a kind of brainwashing that takes place under the stress of terror. And you adapt to the group because you're terrified of losing your life. And you see this also in Afghanistan. I think it's very, um, very evident um, the, the illiteracy, but, but the women, I believe change will take is taking place because of is it really the women I think to to some degree again it's going to take generations I might, I unfortunately probably won't see it in my lifetime um you know I hope for it but I I do feel also that uh we um you know, uh, you were talking about the Prophet Muhammad. Um, Islam has a tremendous attraction for orphans. Um, like Mary in the Bible becomes, she becomes the mother of the orphans in Islam. And it, just as in Judaism, Christianity, also the orphan, the stranger, the widow, they, they have very special roles. But it's like the orphan is super, uh, super bi big or important in Islam. And the sense of victimhood is very, very um, well enforced. And that makes it very difficult because if you are feeling the victim, there, let's face it, there are a lot of people out there that feel themselves victims, and uh, it has a, a certain kind of attraction, um, but if you're feeling victim, you're not going to be proactive, and that's part of, part of the difficulty. It, the part is, that, it to, is mind boggling mind-boggling. We need to take a break and we will okay. be back. It's the top of the hour break, so you have about five minutes, okay? Okay. Thank you. We'll be right Thank back you. on Turning the Tide with Dr. Nancy Coburn.